Mac app icon design have always been a treasure trove of fun. And with the recent changes in Mac OS, we've seen Apple double down on dimensionality and materials in app iconography. Photoshop can do a lot of that stuff. So let's say that we want to make a new Finder app icon. I make some really nice templates for icons over at applypixels.com, but really all you need is a 1024 by 1024 pixel canvas. So we could just start by opening up Photoshop and creating a new document. 1024 by 1024 pixels is the largest size needed for macOS app icons. And we'll go down and make sure that the background color is transparent. Uh, just hit create and we can start to create our app icon in here. We could go over and use something like uh, the rounded rectangle tool, for example, and uh, we can sort of drag out a shape here. Oh, and here's a quick tip for you. We'll try to spice this thing up with little quick tips. The shift key is a magical key in Photoshop and holding down shift key uh, has all sorts of properties. But in the case of you dragging out a shape, it makes sure that the proportions stay equal so that you can get a perfect square and we can use these live shape properties, which I love up here. Uh, we can go and say, okay, like maybe something like 120. And uh, now we have like a rounded rectangle, but Apple doesn't really like rounded rectangles. They're not fancy enough. Uh, if you don't have the files for this session, you can totally get by with just doing a rounded rectangle. Most of the stuff that I'll be showing now can easily be applied to any shape. But for the purpose of being super accurate when doing Mac OS icons, I have provided some files um, and uh, you'll find the one called finder.psd in the, in the folder. And so when you're creating modern Mac OS icons, you want to base it on the squircle shape, the super Super ellipse shape that Apple uses. And you'll notice it's a vector shape that has more notes. It creates a sleeker curvature around there. You'll see that same base shape applied in the hardware design as well. Uh, and you can get that from the template file. There's also a bunch of rules when you do icons. We're not going to talk a lot about those rules in this session, but for the purpose of being accurate in these template files, you'll also find a folder called grid plus padding, uh, which as you can see shows you how normal app icons are supposed to uh, be padded on the Mac OS platform. Uh, we're going to disable that again. It's not super important for now. I just wanted you to have those tools. OK, how do we even begin to add some dimensionality into this? Well, one thing that we can do is uh, change the color of the base. First of all, let's go in. Let's choose like a, a bluish hue. We're trying to make the Finder app icon, right? And so we kind of want um, you know, something like that. We're going to use the magic powers bestowed to us by Photoshop layer styles. I'm going to right click this layer here uh, and I'm hitting blending options, which gives me access to the layer styles pane. And this is really where all the magic happens. And uh, we kind of want this shape to look like it's like raised from the background. And one of my favorite ways of doing that is using inner glow. And as you can see, I'm using the blend mode multiply to sort of darken the outer areas of this whole shape. 50% opacity, I'm using a size 10. If this was bigger, like the shadow would be softer, kind of like this, but we want that small, subtle, sharp shadow. So that's a start. Now what we want to do next is apply some lighting to this whole shape. And uh, there's more ways of making lighting in Photoshop than there are attendees at Adobe Max. But here's one of my favorite ways of doing it. And let's make this as a quick tip. Here's Michael's cool way of adding masked gradient highlights. You'll see me coming down and adding a, a gradient to this. Uh, it's just going to be pure white to transparent white. We're going to hit reverse so that the lighting is coming from the top. You'll notice that this gradient fill actually has a mask already. We don't like this mask. This is a raster based mask. And so I'm going to delete that mask, copy the vectors from the layer you want to mask. In this case, the base shape layer. Make sure that you have extras shown in Photoshop, uh, which you can see by going into view and hitting extras or hitting Command H because you want access to those vector nodes here. I'm going to go over and choose my direct selection tool or hitting A uh, so that I can select all these vector nodes from this base shape. And I'm just going to drag a rectangle around it and you see it selects all the nodes. I'm going to hit Command C, copy that stuff, and I'm going to select the gradient fill layer and just hit Command V and paste it. And so now we have a vector-based mask instead of a raster-based mask. Vector-based masks are far superior for many reasons. You're just gonna have to take my word for it. We still wanna clip this gradient field to the base shape so that the layer styles that we have applied uh, will be prioritized. And the way that we do that is simply by uh, holding Option and just placing the cursor between the two layers and just left-clicking. And there we go, boom. So this gradient might be a little too harsh and we can change the color by simply going in and uh, changing the gradient. Something like that, maybe. I'll make sure to change both points of the gradient down here. 
Uh, there we go. Hit OK. I kind of like this, but I think we can improve it. And usually what I end up doing when I create this type of lighting is I stack multiple gradient fills on top of each other until I'm happy. Um, so let's go down and add yet another gradient fill down here, gradient. Uh, we're gonna just uh, reverse it and uh, we're gonna delete the raster mask and we're gonna paste the vector mask and we're gonna clip it onto the layer. And then for this one, what I wanna do is I wanna play around with blending modes. I love blending modes. It's really one of the powers of Photoshop. And my favorite blending mode is actually overlay. Now check this out. Look at this. Look at the lighting of this whole thing. This might be a little too harsh, but even if I'm just sort of like flipping this layer on and off, I way better like this color gradient than the one we had from pure white. You can see how the colors are sort of breaking into this teal and then going into the deeper blue. I love that. And we can just drop down the opacity of this layer until we're happy. And here's another quick tip for you. The way that you can drop opacity is basically by selecting any layer and clicking the number paths on your keyboard uh, one, it's almost barely visible. Five, it's 50% middle of the road. Zero, it's 100. I love using the keyboard when I can. I think that's pretty cool. Um, but what this really needs now is shadow, right? Uh, and there are so many ways to do shadow. Here's one of my favorite ones. I usually take the layer that I want to cast a shadow and copy it. And here's another quick tip for you. Holding down option and dragging out any layer will create a duplicate version of that layer. And so now we have a base copy. We can disable the effects from this one. Let's rename it to shadow. Change the color to like something like black. We wanna apply some effects to this. And so we will go in and we will hit convert to smart object. And we're gonna go into filter and we're gonna apply Gaussian blur. There we go. Maybe something like a radius of 10 is fine. Um, it's like a big soft thing. Here you go. It looks like clip art from the 90s. And what we'll then do is drop down the opacity to something a little more manageable. And what I like to do is just offset the shadow just a little bit underneath the shape, kind of like this. And there you go. Look at that thing. Now we kind of have something. It's a shape that definitely has mass, but really it consists of this shadow layer here. If we disable that, we disable the effects on the base shape layer and the two gradient fills and boom, we're left back with just that simple flat shape. So just by adding those things, we kind of create this illusion of, of an object in space. I think that's really cool. Anyways, we're trying to make the finder icon here, so let's get back on track. Um, you guys know that the finder icon has that cube face, right? And really what I could do is just go to the pen tool, hit P, and start to draw out that little shape there. But I'm not gonna make you look through 20 minutes of me tweaking my vectors until I'm happy. So like a good cooking program, I've kind of cheated a little bit and uh, you'll find a folder in your files called right side. Um, if you enable that, you'll notice this bad boy here. Let me just break it down for you because it's really not that complex and it's built with the exact same tools almost as what we just did. As you can see, this base shape is really just vector. So let's try to build it back up to better understand how to get this effect. First of all, we're adding back in the shadow. It's made in exactly the same way as the shadow we just did. Let's reapply these effects to the base layer and go over them one by one. So first of all, bevel and emboss. It's such a neat way to add like a small highlight or a small shadow to an edge, in this case both. Uh, you can see if I enable it and disable it, it sort of creates that subtle light there. We're using inner glow just like we did before, which I feel adds like the illusion of the edge of this thing uh, having some curvature. And then we're dropping shadow and shout out to when the Photoshop team announced that we could stack multiple layer styles. I was in the crowd that day and I went wild. Um, Multiple drop shadows is nice. Here we have sort of a multiply, which is pretty a pretty hard shadow right underneath. And then we have a another multiply, but with some color in it uh, to sort of like blend that, blend it in a little bit more. There you go. So that's the layer styles. Next up, I do something that I do all the time, which is clip on a layer that's similar to the base layer, but it has 0% fill. And that means that we can then apply layer styles that affect the shape underneath. Let me show you. So again, I'm adding a bevel and emboss to this layer, and so it's applying that to the shape underneath. One last thing to round off this new face area of the icon is a little technique I use all the time to add some tactility. Let's do it as a quick tip. Are your icons way too flat? Do you need a little bit of tactility in your life? Try noise. I'm just gonna go up here and choose a rectangle tool and just drag out a square shape. Then I'm gonna go and convert that rectangle to a smart object. And then I'm gonna go into filter 
and I'm gonna go into noise, add noise. I usually go with something like the max amount and I'm going with the monochromatic because I don't really want the colors in there. I just want black and white and hit okay. Now you have a really noisy picture. But the cool thing is this thing, we can call it noise, this layer, you can choose something like overlay and you can clip it onto things like this face area. Uh, and then you can drop down the opacity and look at that. You start to see that this noise layer actually kind of creates some definition in this shape. It looks like it's made from a real material. Okay, the finder icon is almost done. But of course, we need to put a smile on his face. Here's how you do that. Enable this layer. Uh, look into this folder. It's literally just three shape layers. I apply a few effects to them to make them appear as they're sort of inset into the material. And that's it. That's our little guy. That's the finder icon. These little techniques can be used to create dimensional buttons in UI and to create hierarchy in content. I use this stuff all the time.